Our reading today can be found in the First Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 1, verses 19 to 45. This is the word of Yahweh. Then, just as Yahweh, our Elohim, had ordered us, we set out from Horeb and went through all that great and terrible wilderness that you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites, until we reached Kadesh Barnea. I said to you, you have reached the hill country of the Amorites, which Yahweh, our Elohim, is giving us. See, Yahweh, your Elohim has given the land to you. Go up, take possession, as Yahweh, the Elohim of your ancestors, has promised you. Do not fear or be dismayed. All of you came to me and said, Let us send men ahead of us to explore the land for us, and bring back a report to us regarding the route by which we should go up and the cities we will come to. The plan seemed good to me, and I selected twelve of you, one from each tribe. They set out and went up into the hill country. And when they reached the valley of Eskol, they spied it out, and gathered some of the land's produce, which they brought down to us. They brought back a report to us and said, It is a good land that Yahweh, our Elohim, is giving us. But you were unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of Yahweh, your Elohim. You grumbled in your tents and said, It is because Yahweh hates us that he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to hand us over to the Amorites to destroy us. Where are we headed? Our kindred have made our hearts melt by reporting the people are stronger and taller than we. The cities are large and fortified up to heaven. We actually saw there the offspring of the Anakim. I said to you, have no dread or fear of them. Yahweh, your Elohim, who goes before you, is the one who will fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes, and in the wilderness, where you saw how Yahweh, your Elohim, carried you, just as one carries a child, all the way that you traveled until you reached this place. But in spite of this, you have no trust in the Yahweh, your Elohim, who goes before you on the way to seek out a place for you to camp, in fire by night, and in the cloud by day, to show you the route you should take. When Yahweh heard your words, he was wrathful and swore, Not one of these, not one of this evil generation shall see the good land that I swore to give to your ancestors. Except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, he shall see it, and to him and to his descendants I will give the land on which he set foot, because of his complete fidelity to Yahweh. Even with me, Yahweh was angry on your account, saying, You also shall not enter there. Joshua, son of Nun, your assistant, shall enter there. Encourage him, for he is the one who, shall, who will secure Israel's possession of it. And as for your little ones, who you thought would become booty, your children, who today do not yet know right from wrong, they shall enter there. To them I will give it, and they shall take possession of it. But as for you, journey back into the wilderness, in the direction of the Sea of Reeds. You answered me, We have sinned against Yahweh. We are ready to go up and fight, just as Yahweh our Elohim commanded us. So all of you strapped on your battle gear and thought it easy to go up into the hill country. Yahweh said to me, Say to them, Do not go up and do not fight, for I am not in the midst of you. Otherwise you will be defeated by your enemies. Although I told you, you would not listen. You rebelled against the command of Yahweh and presumptuously went up into the hill country. The Amorites who lived in that hill country then came out against you and chased you as bees do. They beat you down in Seir as far as Hormah. When you returned and wept before Yahweh, Yahweh would neither heed your voice nor pay you any attention. When God first brought Moses and the Israelites to the borders of the land God promised to Abraham and to his descendants, three things scared them. Moses has preserved them in Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 28 as follows. The people are stronger and taller than we. The cities are large and fortified up to the heavens. We actually saw there the offspring of the Anakim. First, the people were stronger and taller than the Israelites. Victor Matthews, in his book Manners and Customs of the Bible, has reported that the average height of men of Semitic ethnicity in the ancient Near East, which included the Israelites, was around five foot tall. Given that the average height of a man worldwide in 2024 is a little over five foot seven inches tall, most men living today would have appeared as giants to the Israelites at that time. The Dead Sea Scroll manuscripts of 1 Samuel describe Goliath as having been six foot six inches tall, a real giant by comparison with his peers, 
though not a giant in comparison with today's elite athletes. So the people being described in Deuteronomy were not necessarily giants by our standards today, but the Israelites reported them as having been considerably taller and stronger than were they. And given that war at the time would have been waged hand to hand, their fear is understandable. Second, the cities of the land of Canaan were large and fortified, with walls extending high into the sky. In our first discussion, I mentioned that most critical scholars of the Old Testament prefer the date of 1290 BC for the Exodus, and modern archaeologists have often observed that there is very little evidence of fortified settlements in Canaan at that time. However, the biblical date of the Exodus, which can be worked back from evidence in 1 Kings and 1 Chronicles with respect to the construction of the temple under the reign of King Solomon, is 1446 BC, and there is archaeological evidence for fortified settlements at that time. In any case, the Israelites had been slaves in Egypt for 450 years, and they had neither siege works nor training in the sieging and taking of fortified cities. Walls over which they could not quickly climb, which is what is meant by walls extending into the heavens, would have certainly seemed insurmountable to them. Third, the spies reported as having seen descendants of the Anakim in the land. The book of Numbers has preserved this report in more detail, in Numbers chapter 13 verses 32 to 33 as follows. So they brought to the Israelites an unfavorable report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land that we have gone through as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great size. There we saw the Nephilim, the Anakites, come from the Nephilim, and to ourselves we seemed like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. Well, who were the Nephilim and their descendants? These groups have been addressed several times in the text of Deuteronomy. We find the Anakim here in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 28. As Dwayne Christensen has noted in his commentary in the Word Biblical Commentary series, the name seems to derive from the Hebrew word for neck and may mean something like long-necked. We find the Anakim associated with two other groups, called the Rephaim and the Emim, in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. The text reads as follows. When we had headed out along the route of the wilderness of Moab, Yahweh said to me, Do not harass Moab or engage them in battle, for I will not give you any of its land as a possession, since I have given Ar as a possession to the descendants of Lot. The Amim, a large and numerous people, as tall as the Anakim, had formerly inhabited it. Like the Anakim, they are usually reckoned as Rephaim, though the Moabites call them Amim. And in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, we find that the king of the region of Bashan was also to be associated with these groups. This is Deuteronomy chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. Now only King Og of Bashan was left of the remnant of the Rephaim. In fact, his bed, an iron bed, can still be seen in Rabbah of the Ammonites. By the common cubit, it is nine cubits long and four cubits wide. As for the land that we took possession of at that time, I gave to the Reubenites and Gadites the territory north of Aror, that is on the edge of the Wadi Arnon, as well as half the hill country of Gilead with its towns. And I gave to the half-tribe of Manasseh the rest of Gilead and all of Bashan, Og's kingdom. The whole region of Argob, all that portion of Bashan, used to be called a land of Rephaim. As Numbers 13 verses 32 to 33 has told us, the origin of both of these groups, the Rephaim and the Anakim, were for the Israelite prophets, the Nephilim. Now both the titles Nephilim and Anakim do seem to be associated with giants of some sort. As I've already noted, Anakim seems to mean long-necked. Nephilim, though, has proven a bit harder to translate. Some Hebrew scholars have suggested that the name comes from the Hebrew verb nafal, which means to fall. However, the preserved pronunciation, which is evidenced in the Masoretic vowel pointing, does not support that origin. Personally, I agree with Dr. Michael Heiser's assessment that the word nephilim is most likely a later editorial insertion of the Aramaic term nafila, which means giant. 
So there is clearly something about height and size in these terms, which has led a number of Old Testament scholars, most notably in my research, both Dwayne Christensen and Peter Craigie, to assume that these were physically tall and strong people groups in comparison to the Israelites. However, there was more than physical strength and stature in view for the Israelites. The term Rephaim helps to point us in a more spiritual direction. When the Hebrew term Rephaim refers to living humans, it is often either left untranslated or translated as giants. However, when the Hebrew term Rephaim is used in reference to spiritual beings, it's often translated as shades or the spirits of dead warrior kings. Dr. Michael Heiser has helped to bring some of this together in his book, The Unseen Realm. Here are Dr. Heiser's words. Deuteronomy 3 mentions Og's reign over the city of Edri. Joshua chapter 12 verses 4 through 5, which looks back on the battle with Og, refers to him as the king of Bashan and living at Ashtarot and Edri. These terms, Ashtarot, Edri, and Bashan, were theologically loaded terms for an Israelite, and even for their neighbors who worshipped other gods. Ashtarot, Edri, and the Rephaim are mentioned by name in Ugaritic texts. The Rephaim of Ugarit are not described as giants. Rather, they are quasi-divine, dead warrior kings who inhabit the underworld. In the Ugaritic language, the location of Ashtarot and Edri was not spelled Bashan, but was pronounced and spelled Bathan. The linguistic note is intriguing, since Bashan and Bathan both also mean serpent, so that the region of Bashan was the place of the serpent. As we saw earlier, the divine serpent, the Nakash, another word so translated, became lord of the dead after his rebellion in Eden. In effect, Bashan was considered the location of, to borrow a New Testament phrase, the gates of hell. Later, Jewish writers understood these conceptual connections. Their intersection is at the heart of why books like First Enoch teach that demons are actually the spirits of dead Nephilim. That's the end of the quotation. The Israelites' fear of the Anakim was not a fear based solely on their physical strength and stature. There was something spiritual about these groups, and they were connected for the Israelites with the events that preceded the great flood in the days of Noah. We find the following in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. When people began to multiply on the face of the ground and daughters were born to them, the sons of Elohim saw that they were fair, and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. Then Yahweh said, My spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh. Their days shall be one hundred twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of Elohim went in to the daughters of humans who bore children to them. These were the heroes that were of old, warriors of renown. Yahweh saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And Yahweh was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So Yahweh said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Some scholars have insisted that the phrase B'nai Ha-Elohim, which has been translated sons of God in the New Revised Standard Version, refers to godly humans, and therefore the daughters of man are to be associated with children of ungodly humans. For these scholars, Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 7 has described the intermarrying of godly and ungodly people, which resulted in the spread of corruption throughout the human race. However, as nicely as such a reading might fit into the modern, materialistic worldview of contemporary Western societies, there is little evidence that this was how the prophetic tradition of Israel understood the passage. In the Hebrew Masoretic text of the First Testament, the phrase, sons of God, occurs only four times, twice in Genesis 6 and twice in the book of Job, in Job chapter 1 verse 6 and in Job chapter 2 verse 1. In both cases in Job, the New Revised Standard Version has translated the phrase as heavenly beings, 
And that's quite accurate. Sons of God is a First Testament way of speaking of spiritual beings. So in Genesis chapter 6, verse 2, when it says the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they took women for themselves of all that they chose, the text has described an encounter between spiritual beings and human women. Now, it should be noted that the text does not explicitly say that the spiritual beings and human women engaged in sexual intercourse. It says simply that the spiritual beings took women for themselves. Now, of course, this could imply marriage and copulation, but it also may not. The text also does not state explicitly that the Nephilim were products of this interaction. The text simply says that the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. With that said, however, the ancient Jewish text of First Enoch has interpreted this incident as one in which spiritual beings copulated with human females, thereby creating a race of demigod-like kings called the Nephilim, one quality of whom was enhanced stature. The Rephaim was a name for the spirits of these kings who died in the flood. And in the days of Jesus, these Rephaim were commonly associated with demons. For those who are interested in reading more about this in detail, I would recommend reading Dr. Heiser's book, The Unseen Realm. Now, if this reading, represented by First Enoch, were completely accurate, then it would leave us with an apparently intractable dilemma. If the Nephilim were products of the copulation of human females and angelic beings, and if their offspring were destroyed in the flood, the spirits of whom became demons, then how could it be that there were descendants of the Nephilim in the land of Canaan during the time of Moses and Joshua? Even more, Genesis itself has anticipated this reality when it says in Genesis 6 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. To put it another way, Genesis seems to have insisted that the flood did not kill off the Nephilim. So is there any way to reconstruct what might have occurred? The backstory of Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 7 seems to be related to a Sumerian religious tale of a group of sages known as the Apkalu. We recall that Abraham himself had been Sumerian. In his book Reversing Hermon, Dr. Heiser has written the following about this story, and this is a lengthy quotation but worthwhile. Heiser has written the following. Greenfield's brief summary of the Apkalu states, In Mesopotamian religion, the term Apkalu, Sumerian Abgal, is used for the legendary creatures endowed with extraordinary wisdom. Seven in number, they are the culture heroes from before the flood. In the myth of the twenty-one poultices, the seven Abkalu of Eridu, who are also called the seven Abkalu of the Apsu, are at the service of Ea, or Enki. A variety of wisdom traditions from the antediluvian period were supposedly passed on by the Abkalu. The tradition of the Apkalu is preserved in the Beat Mazari ritual series and also by Barassus. The seven sages were created in the river and served as those who ensured the correct functioning of the plans of heaven and earth. Following the example of Ea, they taught mankind wisdom, social forms, and craftsmanship. The authorship of texts dealing with omens, magic, and other categories of wisdom, such as medicine, is attributed to the seven Apkalu. Readers familiar with the Watchers episode in First Enoch will be able to see a clear parallel to the Watcher story from even this cursory summary. The Apkalu were divine beings, bestowing special knowledge to humankind. This is precisely what the Watchers were blamed for in First Enoch, but there is much more. Several other specific links to Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 will be evident as we proceed. As Greenfield's summary noted, the seven Apkalu were thought to have been created in the river and were assigned the correct functioning of the plans of heaven and earth. The river is actually a reference to the primeval deep in Mesopotamian thought. This watery abode was located under the earth, hence the underworld, and was part of, or equivalent to, depending on the text, the abyss, called the Apsu, or Abzu, by Mesopotamians, or the realm of the dead. Readers will recall the same sort of conception for the realm of the dead in biblical material, for example in Job chapter 26 verses 5 through 6. 
This means that, for Mesopotamians, the Apkalu came from the abyss and were responsible for maintaining the correct balance between heaven and earth that was the will of the greater gods. As such, the Apkalu were thought to possess knowledge from the divine world that made heaven and earth tick, so to speak. Over time, the Apkalu had dealings with humanity. Mesopotamian literature presents them as the great antediluvian or pre-flood sages, culture heroes who brought the arts of civilization to the land. During the time that follows this period, nothing new is invented. The original revelation is only transmitted and unfolded. This process of civilizing the world of men is viewed positively in Mesopotamian thought. So much so that claims of both the physical ancestry and equality to antediluvian figures were important for Mesopotamian kings and scholars alike. This was especially the case with respect to the Apkalu, for such associations meant that humans could claim access to knowledge held only by the gods in the Mesopotamian Divine Council, an idea that would have been used to legitimize status, power, and influence. It is difficult to do justice to the importance of the idea that the knowledge that made Mesopotamian civilization great, particularly in the case of Babylon, came from a divine source. And that's the end of the quotation. Of course, Heiser there is talking about a Sumerian source, and most scholars assume that source to be ancient mythology, and it is that, to a large extent. However, the text of Genesis seems to suggest that some of what the Sumerians preserved was based in real history. In Genesis chapter 6, verses 1-7, through 7, the Apkalu are called the sons of God. Later, the writer or writers of First Enoch would call the same beings watchers, irim in Hebrew. Taken together, I suspect that the Sumerian text helps us to see that the intercourse which occurred between spiritual beings and humans in Genesis 6 was not sexual, but intellectual. To say it another way, the sons of God impregnated humanity with knowledge, and this knowledge produced a culture which was dominated by the Nephilim. And Genesis tells us who the Nephilim were. Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 has told us that these were the heroes that were of old, warriors of renown. The Hebrew says literally, these were Hagivarim, Asher, Me'olam. The first word comes from the Hebrew word Gibor, which refers to strength or might. In later Arabic, it came to refer to tyrants. In Biblical Hebrew, however, it referred to those who were exceptionally skilled in a given task. It was most often used in reference either to fighting or to hunting. The second phrase means literally, from forever, and it seems to be used to indicate that these individuals were legendary figures, the mightiest who ever lived. Genesis describes them finally as men of the name, that is, men who were respected or feared. In other words, Nephilim was a way of describing the mightiest and most skillful of human beings, who were respected and feared. Prior to the Flood, the Nephilim's greatness has been associated with the deliverance of knowledge to humanity from rebellious spiritual beings, what we might today call fallen angels. Somehow, by this knowledge, these leaders became great, and part of that greatness was legendary stature and strength. What we've discovered in Deuteronomy is that either this knowledge survived the flood, or, and I find this to be more likely, the collaboration between fallen spiritual beings and humans resumed at some point after the flood. When the Israelite spies told Moses and the people that they had seen the Anakim in the land, what they meant was that they saw evidence that the people in Canaan were collaborating with fallen spiritual beings, and as a consequence, some who resembled the old Nephilim had arisen to lead them. It's no wonder that the Israelites did not want to go in and take the land of Canaan at first. They did not perceive the task as simply one human people battling another. The people of the land, from the perspective of Israel, were being aided by fallen spiritual beings. Now, one might wonder why Israel thought those beings were any match for the God of Israel. After all, God had just delivered his people from slavery in Egypt by displaying his mastery over the entire Egyptian pantheon. Exodus has explained the ten plagues God sent against the Egyptians as this sort of spiritual war against the gods of Egypt, themselves assumed to be spiritual beings of the sort working in the land of Canaan. 
Shouldn't then the Israelites have been confident in God's power? Well, certainly God and Moses thought that they should have learned to trust him by then. But I can see the logic of their fears. After all, Egypt still existed. God did not destroy the Egyptians and give the land to the Israelites. God made a way for Israel out of Egypt, but he did not conquer Egypt for them. And even more, Egypt was only one nation. In the conquest of the Holy Land, God was calling them to conquer and displace dozens of city-states, each collaborating with a different spiritual entity. Even more, there were no descendants of the Nephilim in Egypt, but the land of Canaan was full of them. From the perspective of the Israelites, the conquest of the Holy Land would have been a far greater feat than the escape from Egypt had been. And it seems as though the Israelites were not sure that they, even with God on their side, would be capable of achieving it. In the end, Deuteronomy has preserved the fact that both Moses and God saw the Israelites' fear for what it was. The people did not believe that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who had delivered them from slavery in Egypt, was greater than the Nephilim and their fallen spiritual guides. As a consequence, God determined that only Caleb and Joshua would be allowed to participate in the conquest of the Holy Land and the fulfillment of God's promise to destroy the descendants of the Nephilim and to remove forever all that had been acquired by means of the human nation's collaboration with fallen spiritual beings, or, as the Apostle Paul would later say, with demons. When the people heard this, they tried to repent of their doubtfulness by arming themselves in preparation to attack, but God would not hear their repentance, and he told Moses to command them to stand down. They proceeded with the attack anyway, and because God was not with them, they were easily routed. Deuteronomy tells us that no matter how much they protested, no matter how much they apologized, no matter how much they wept, God would not change his mind. At this point in Deuteronomy, the people of Israel have completed 40 years of wandering in the wilderness between Egypt and the Holy Land. All those who had refused to go into the land and confront the human nations who had built their civilizations by cooperating with demonic spirits were then dead. As God had prophesied, of that generation only Moses, Joshua, and Caleb were still alive. And because of Moses' failure to obey God at the waters of Meribah in the wilderness of Zin, an event preserved in Numbers chapter 20 verses 1 through 13, Moses too would not enter. Of those still living, only Joshua and Caleb would enter. And on this occasion, Moses wanted to remind the people of why they had wandered for forty years. According to Moses, they had wandered because they feared the might of nations who built their might by collaborating with the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. They feared the people of the land, they feared their technology, and they feared their great heroes, all of which had come from their collaboration with demonic powers. We'll find out in upcoming discussions that God had already defeated some of the descendants of the Nephilim before that day in Deuteronomy. Those experiences will be summarized in the next few chapters of Deuteronomy and have also been preserved in the book of Numbers. So the current Israelites had more on which to base their faith in the God of Israel than had their parents. Not only had they the testimony of their parents with respect to God's defeat of the gods of Egypt, but they also had experienced God's defeat of some of the Nephilim themselves. But still, Moses recalled this history to remind them not to repeat the mistakes of the past. When I think of the Israelites' fear of the Anakim, I sympathize. In our own day, a great deal of knowledge and technological advancement has been achieved by setting aside the requirements of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who became flesh in the person of Jesus. And many have become Nephilim in our day by collaboration with demonic spirits, spirits which have whispered ways of rebellion, corruption, deceitfulness, carnality, and self-centeredness into their hearts. There are times when I feared that the only way to become truly great and powerful and renowned in our world is to set aside Jesus' teachings and to supplant them with the teachings of the fallen spirits of our age. This is how the Nephilim and their descendants have always arisen. And like Israel, I too have feared them. I have feared the technology and weaponry born from unrighteousness, 
and I feared those who have become great by walking in ways incompatible with the example and teaching of Jesus. If we are to learn from the example of Joshua and of Caleb, we must walk in the way of Jesus, believing that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. That was a quotation from St. John the Apostle. The full passage can be found in 1 John chapter 4, verses 1-6, through 6, which, if heard in the context of the Israelites' fear of the Anakim, can take on a more comprehensive meaning. The scripture says this, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. Little children, you are from God, and have conquered them, for the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, what they say is from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us, and whoever is not from God does not listen to us. From this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. For those who live as the inhabitants of Canaan lived, in collaboration with the spiritual beings who have joined the rebellion of the serpent, who have taught humanity knowledge for their own gain and for our destruction. The passage with which we will conclude is one of warning and fear, for Jesus is coming. But for those who have placed their faith in Jesus, by walking as he walked, be encouraged. For a day is coming when the prophetic oracle of St. John the Apostle, preserved in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, will be fulfilled. This is the scripture. Then I saw a great white throne, and the one who sat on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Also another book was opened, the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works, as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them and all were judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Death and Hades, of course, were thought of as gods by the pagan Romans in John's day. The Greek name translated death is Thanatos. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, Thanatos was the son of Nyx, the goddess of night, and the brother of Hypnus, the god of sleep. He appeared to humans to carry them off to the underworld when the time allotted to them by the fates had expired. The same source also reports that Hades was the god of the underworld, who supervised the trial and punishment of the wicked after death. In other words, death and Hades have been described by John as what the Sumerians called Apkalu, Genesis has called sons of God, First Enoch has called watchers, and the New Testament has called demons. Death and Hades represent fallen spiritual beings in rebellion against God. John had already described the defeat of their leader, the ancient serpent, called Satan or the devil, in Revelation chapter 20 verse 10. And now, we're told that the serpent's compatriots too are cast into the lake of fire, along with all who collaborated with them and lived by their teachings. May those who have ears to hear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Amen.